Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And welcome to the John L. Weinberg Distinguished Speakers event for 2022. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the University of Delaware and Clayton Hall. Uh, my name is Bruce Weber. I'm the Dean of the Lerner College of Business and Economics here, University of Delaware. I'm really thrilled to be welcoming you and introducing the, the new director of the Weinberg Center in a, in a minute. Um, we've got a wonderful day uh, planned for you, and what's really gratifying to me is, in spite of the fact that we put two of our basketball teams into the NCAA championship, and they, yes! <laughs> And they fought hard. They're fighting blue hens, um, did not go forward. So we don't have those exciting games to look forward to this weekend, but they had two terrific seasons. What's really wonderful about the group in front of you now is three of them are blue hen graduates. So it's terrific for me as an administrator here at the university to have our alumni back to turn around and, and give back to us as a university and move forward our mission with educating and leading knowledge creation in the areas of business economics and corporate governance. Um, I became the dean here 10 and a half years ago. I returned from the London Business School where I'd been a professor for 10 years. And every year I've learned more about corporate governance and the role of this state in the public markets and shareholder institutions. And it's really been a, 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 an educational journey for me that I've really valued. And some of my, my tutors are, are in this room today, and I appreciate all that they've, they've taught me. Now, the Lerner College has 3,400 undergraduate students and 900 graduate students. There's been business education at the University of Delaware since 1917. We became known as the Lerner College in 2002 when we were named after Al Lerner, the former chairman of the MBNA uh, uh, banking and, and credit card group. So we take that journey that Al Lerner had very seriously. And if you look at his background, it really was um, coming from, from very little. Uh, a family that had immigrated to Brooklyn, New York, uh, from what was the Soviet Union in the 1930s, uh, had a very successful academic career, went to Columbia, joined the Marines, went into furniture, later real estate, and then banking. And I like to tell our students that if you look at the Al Lerner story, there's something there for all of us to aspire to. Um, I think John L. Weinberg, uh, similarly, uh, uh, CEO of Goldman Sachs from 1976 to 1990, a director of the DuPont Company, again, an amazing success story and something that I think we can all uh, learn from. We like to let our students know that business does a lot of good for society and that they, as in their training as managers, are preparing to do good things for society and their communities. So I'm very uh, pleased to be able to be the dean and to run a college that has so many useful initiatives going on. We've got what we call outreach centers on six different topics. Corporate governance is one of them, but we also have a horn program in entrepreneurship. We've got a center for financial services analytics that works on data science issues that arise in financial services. We've got a Women's Leadership Institute, a Center for Economic Education, and we've got a trading center where we give our students a chance to work with Wall Street technology and to manage uh, a $4 million slice of the university's endowment. So a lot of exciting things going on in Lerner College, and I think today's event, bringing back alums, putting the uh, program together uh, today is, is terrific. Um, I'm very honored that uh, on the first panel we have Andre Bouchard here, former chancellor, who's uh, uh, stepping into the chair role of the advisory board for the Weinberg uh, Center, and that's very helpful to me and very helpful to the next person who's gonna come up to the podium, uh, Justin Klein. Justin is the new director of the Weinberg Center, stepped into the role this past fall, and is doing a tremendous job both for our students and our faculty and the legal community here in Delaware. And it's terrific to have you as a colleague. Justin, welcome. Uh, thanks so much, Dean Weber. I also wanna welcome you here. We're really delighted to see you all. I think that this is a, quite a substantial in-person event and we're really delighted about that. Just a couple of administrative announcements. One is 
Uh, we have approval for Delaware CLE, and if you would like to receive it, please sign the sign-in sheet just outside the room uh, when you come in, and please sign it when you, uh, when you exit. Um, and uh, we will have a luncheon after this, um, after this program, and we'd be delighted to, uh, to have you all join us. To the extent that you have questions during the course of the program, my colleague Louisa Cresson will um, get, provide you with a microphone so that you can ask that. And I uh, just want to turn this program over now to Andy Bouchard, my uh, uh, chairman of the advisory board, former chancellor. Um, he just wants to uh, frame this program for you and, and really describe the background of how it came together. Thanks. Andy? Does that do it? All right. Thank you, Cynthia. Anyway, so for those that didn't hear what I said, um, this is the John L. Weinberg um, Leadership Speakers Series. And typically, you might expect a podium with you know one person standing at it giving you a lecture. That indeed is the kind of program that's occurred for the past 20 years. Justin uh, became the new executive director. I came in as chair of the advisory board in October, and he turned to me, and his first thing was, well, you should be the speaker. And I was like, I don't know that that's the most exciting thing in the world to do. And so I had a different idea. I mean, we all know that Delaware is preeminent in corporate governance. It has this totally national presence. Indeed, it's an international presence. But what may be a little less under the radar, and Bruce made some reference to this, is it's also a very homegrown um, experience uh, that's contributed to Delaware having that presence. And what do I mean by that? Take the gentleman at the end. Grew up in Sussex County, Indian River High School, University of Delaware, trustee of the university. Leo Strine, like me, came to Delaware from another place initially, from Baltimore, grew up in Hocassin, AI DuPont High School. Take the chancellor on the other side, grew up in Smyrna, Delaware, Smyrna High School, at, you know, parents were educators. Our esteemed moderator, Greg Williams, grew up in Stanton, later grew up in Bear a little bit, goes to William Penn High School. There's a real local flavor. And the University of Delaware, indeed, as Bruce said, should be immensely proud. Bill, Leo, Greg, all went to the University of Delaware. And I wanted that to be part of the story, because I think it's worth acknowledging that, because even though this is something of immense national reputation, it's not just people coming in and doing a national gig because they have the expertise. The expertise is right here, right homegrown. And, the, and this institute has that particular home field advantage uh, because of the people that really make the court and do this kind of work. That's really the point I wanted to get across. And then, Craig, I'll let you take it away. Great. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Chancellor. Well, I'm very happy to be here. I won't uh, spend time, because uh, we could talk for much more than our allotted time with these folks. but. I won't do long introductions, but I will remind you when uh, they were uh, members of the court because I had forgotten a little bit of this. Uh, <laughs> Chancellor Chandler uh, came uh, to the court as a vice chancellor in 1989, uh, became the chancellor in 1997 and served in that capacity until 2011. Chief Justice Strine uh, joined the court as a vice chancellor in 1998, uh, served in that capacity until 2011. Uh, and then from 2011 to 2014 was the Chancellor. Chancellor Bouchard uh, was the Chancellor from 2014 until 2021. And Chancellor McCormick uh, took over in 2021 and has a, a long road ahead of her. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so with that, I'll tell you just the, what we have uh, talked about is having each of the Chancellors speak a little bit uh, about sort of what I'll call non-substantive issues, uh, things that they encountered uh, as the chancellor, and then just touch briefly on the doctrinal developments uh, during their uh, era, uh, necessarily at a 30,000 foot level just because of the amount of time that we have. So Chancellor Chandler, we'll start with you. and. Uh, 
Talk a little bit about the way that technology evolved uh, during your tenure. Sure, thanks, Greg. And, and let me start, though, by just thanking you and Andy for putting this together and, uh, and the Weinberg Center for hosting it and all of those folks who've showed up today. Uh, it's really uh, gratifying, and I appreciate it. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I told Greg I'd be happy to sort of talk about what I could remember. <laughs> and he starts off with reminding me, you know, how old I am by telling you I was appointed in 1989. I actually served four years before that on the Superior Court. So I go back to 1985. And I can tell you the first opinions that I was writing was on an IBM Selectric typewriter. And I thought it was fantastic because it had the uh, whiteout tape built into the cube so that you can actually back up and correct your mistakes. And I thought that was a marvelous technology at the time. Um, but I soon learned that we were going to move beyond that. So the other thing I wanted to tell you is that you know, the technology changes that occurred at the court couldn't have happened without the people that I had working with me, number one, which was Leo, Jack Jacobs, Myron Steele, um, and Steve Lamb. So I really credit them for the support they gave me and enabled the court to do all the things it was able to do, which was, you know, introduce, for example, a new electronic filing system, file and serve, mm -hmm. which, you know, isn't perfect. And I think there are things that we could do better with that, but I think it's a movement that we heralded in during my tenure on the court. We also uh, built three courthouses during my tenure on the court. And I actually wore a hard hat and supervised the building of one of those courthouses in Sussex County and helped lay the bricks that you walk on when you go into that courthouse. So I feel a certain pride about that. But we had those technology changes, and that made the court move faster uh, with file and serve. The courthouses that were built were modernized in the sense of you had video screens. You could live stream, even live stream, Greg, as you remember, the Disney trial yes. uh, online. And so those were just amazing ways that we, I thought, improved the efficiency of the court and the transparency of the court's work. How did the rollout of e-filing go, Chancellor? Was it smooth or was it rough? Well, it was kind of rough, I thought, at the time. I mean, it was a learning experience for everybody, not only the members of the court, but the bar. Um, the Superior Court had kind of led the way, and we were luckily following their lead a bit, which helped, I think, some in the rollout of that. The other thing that was happening almost simultaneously to that, people don't remember this probably, but the court's clerical arm, the, the part of the court that handles all the filings, was not part of the court. It was mm -hmm. actually a county office. Uh, the register in chancery was an elected official that ran countywide and answered to the voters, not to the court. Um, and Leo was very helpful to me in getting that through the legislature because we ran into some roadblocks and some obstacles that we had to overcome, and he was terrific in helping us get that adopted so that we actually absorbed that office as a state office. And that was critical, I think, to the court's operations going forward. Yeah, the change to e-filing really did change uh, the practice uh, for those of us who are old enough to remember. You used to have to take your filing over to the registrar's office in the public building, and I can remember many times sprinting over there to get there by <laughs> five, and, and then it made a big difference to develop a personal relationship with the folks in there because it was 501, and you look through the glass with this, please, <laughs> please, please. They, they would often uh, take it. So it was a, a big change. Another huge change uh, that I think started during your tenure, Chancellor, was that the, the Chancery Bar is still small, but, but back in the 80s, it was really small, and it started to change, both on the defense and the plaintiff side. Sure. I mean, when I first started in 89, and I'm going to leave names out, and I apologize for that, but... Again, it's my memory. And, 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 as, and as I was reminded by a recent opinion in the Court of Chancery, not by the Chancellor, but all of our memories is subject to sort of uh, a recollection failure, that you're, a, you're actually likely not to remember the actual facts as they occurred, because your own subjective subconscious will filter those facts to make them conform to what you believe today actually happened. I, it's beyond me a little bit. I, I apologize, Chancellor. That part of the opinion, I had a little, I didn't take enough psychology courses, I don't think. But anyway, but. I, the, the, say, I think the same phenomenon does apply to judges. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but in the beginning, I remember Joe Rosenthal and Norm Monheit 
coming into the courtroom almost all the time in all the litigation and introducing someone maybe from Milberg Weiss from New York perhaps. Mm -hmm. But that was the, the lineup most yeah. of the time. Now, and then it began to transform itself. And you began to see sort of boutique law firms growing up in Delaware like Grant and Eisenhower, like Abrams and Laster, like Lamb and Bouchard, right. which later became Bouchard Friedlander. Um, and you, and uh, Ross, Aaron, cites Ross and Aaronstam, another one. And you began to see different personnel on the plaintiff side in some of these cases. And you also began to see a change in the defense personnel yeah. because national law firms began moving in yeah. uh, and you began seeing a different mix of players in the courtroom, which interestingly has a fun, had an effect, I think a, a positive effect on Delaware in terms of something you probably don't think about, the diversity of the bar. It's actually done an amazing thing. And I, I think if you look at our courts, it's actually helped there as well. So that's sort of one of the more positive things I think about in terms of these changes in the law firms that have appeared. I was first, by the way, Bill, out of those four you mentioned. Just want you to know, <laughs> Steve and I. You were first. <laughs> but, but one effect of that, I think the emergence of the new firms, particularly the plaintiff's firms, uh, was that stockholder litigation, which when I started was always kind of just a, you know, sort of a, just a tag along to the main litigation <laughs> at that time between uh, takeover combatants. But stockholder litigation uh, sort of stepped up and became a big part of, of what we were doing because in part the lawyers got so much better and were now able to uh, try cases back in the early 80s really wasn't much of a threat that they would take <laughs> something to trial. Then that all changed. Uh, I think of Stewart in particular as, right. uh, as changing a lot of that. Well, Chancellor, <clears throat> speak a little bit about doctrinal developments uh, during your time. Th that, that's hard to do, even at a 30,000 foot level. I mean, I try to think back about the types of cases we were hearing, and, and Leo was there with me. We, we had the m &A, the typical M&A cases, which were in, injunctive in nature. And those cases were very fast moving. I mean, they, they came before you, they were quickly you know, either decided or settled, um, but they weren't these long drawn out proceedings, post, you know, post closing type transactions and proceedings now that you see. So you saw a lot of that. And I remember also a lot of alternative entity cases which were coming to us for the very first time. Mm -hmm. And we were struggling with some of the fundamental issues there. Very contractually driven, but also worried about our fiduciary duties applicable or not. So we had all those kinds of cases. <clears throat> and we had the typical you know, appraisal litigation going on during all this period, sort of the standard, which has now changed dramatically. Um, and then, you know, there were changes that came later when Leo was on uh, as chancellor that really were most remarkable in terms of shaping our law. Yeah, there, there was an evolution. Um, we still, of course, have injunctive practice, but there was an evolution in chancery that began, I think, during your tenure and then certainly has continued toward trials. Yeah. Uh, you know, all of a sudden things started going to trial. Frank Bellotti, my uh, former partner, now deceased, a great uh, lion of the bar used to joke, but I don't think it was a joke, that he never tried a case. Everything he did was uh, at the yeah. injunctive level, and then they would settle, but then... Well, he certainly never tied himself to the record. No, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but, but, the, uh, but, but, but the trials became much more commonplace as the years went yeah. by. The, the, the other thing I think I, that stands out for me in my yeah. mind about the, the cases and the, and the record is, you know, I, I not only had a great group of people working with me, yeah. but I had a, you know, a great rapport. The, the bar and the bench had a great rapport. Uh, there was respect that went both ways, and there was trust that went both ways, yeah. and it was mutual. And that, to me, is an, an, an indispensable ingredient for this court to be successful. It really is. Um, to the extent that that respect and trust becomes more adversarial uh, and more polarized uh, on both sides of that equation, the more it seems to me it's more dangerous and, and going to be difficult for Delaware to maintain the position it's held. That, to me, back when I was there, yeah. these folks, and I know a lot of them, I trusted them, they trusted me. I remember taking people out after a trial in the Technicolor case, and the lawyers all went with me out to a restaurant after the case was over, and we all sat down and had lunch and had drinks together. Uh, th that to me is something that was an important ingredient, the way the court worked, 
with the bar and, and the bar working with the court. And, and that stands out in my mind a lot yeah. today. And we're going to talk uh, yeah. with Chancellor McCormick about that later, about the, the dynamic between, uh, between bench and bar. Chief Justice Strine, you, you came on and you followed two, uh, two sort of big, uh, big uh, leaders in our bar and our bench, uh, Chancellor Allen and Chancellor Chandler. Tell me about that as you assume the, the title. I, I mean, look, it's, I think one of the things that can be daunting, and, and I experienced this when I was a very young lawyer. I mean, I came out and I, uh, you know, I was a summer intern, according to some of, of <laughs> Chancellor Bouchard. I'm proud of that, I, and I, I won't shrink from that. I was at a great law firm, and I worked with people like David Margulies and Tom Allingham, learned from people like Rod Ward about traditions. and. I did share an office, just so you know, with Chancellor Bouchard, and that's because, per his great introduction, and you know, that meant a lot to me as a Delawarean and as a blue hen, and it's very fitting. Rod Ward knew that we were both interested in public service. Right. Andy Bouchard at that time, every as a busy associate, was going to um, feed breakfast to the poor once a week. And so Rod put us together in an office because he knew we grew up here and we were committed to service. That firm also, by the way, the, the first woman on Chancery came from that office. The first two women on the Delaware Supreme Court came from that office. That's never reported in what passes for our local <laughs> newspaper. But, you know, what I'm saying about this is there was a tradition here. And I, Bill Allen clerked for the same judge I did, Walter Stapleton. And it's not also coincidental that some of us clerk, uh, uh, Bill Chandler clerked for Judge Lathe. Judge Lathe. Judge Lathe. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, I won't tell the story about Walter Stapleton and Judge Latcham and the FBI. Uh, it's a great story. It's a great story. It's a great story. Yeah, yeah, we might get to that later, but about. Uh, we'll save time for that. But, but the point is, we both, and, and my governor, remember I was counsel of the governor when I was saying yeah. about Delaware's roles, we had this little thing <clears> called <throat> Delaware versus New York. It was no windfall gang. Every state in the union except New York and Massachusetts were taking to take away yeah. part of our sheet. Mm -hmm. And we have to fight for it, right, Bill, all the time. Mm -hmm. And two of the people I had the most utmost respect for were Bill Allen and Bill Chandler. My governor appointed Bill Chandler as chancellor. Tom Carper, like Mike Castle, I think everybody just thinks of them as great Delawareans, because they, by the way, they are, and they're good friends, too. And, but Bill Chandler, you might know, uh, is a Republican. Tom Carper was a Democrat. That was controversial in areas that hit Governor Carper. He has to deal with the legislature. There might not have been, nobody was going to necessarily vote against it, but they weren't happy. But he did the right thing because this court matters. Absolutely. And so I think during our time, Bill, one of the things we expanded, and I, I, I can't think of my time on Chancery without thinking of Bill. I love him, and, and, and he was a great leader of the court. Is the change in trials also became, we, we did another service for Delaware. No one ever thought of us as a commercial state. And what I mean by that is I volunteered somebody to, I will write the great commercial cases of Delaware law, 1789 to 1999. I'll be done in two weeks. You write the second volume, Great Commercial Cases, 2000 to the Present. And I think of the time there of where the people had gained such confidence in our state that they actually started centering their business to business disputes, mm -hmm. Bill, right? Mm -hmm. Bill fought hard to get every judge to law clerks. Mm -hmm. And that was something we worked together. And again, in the bipartisanship, Myron <laughs> played a critical role in that as the first step. Mm -hmm. And then, and and so, and then the second master. Yes, and the second master, and working with the bar, you know, on these things. And doctrinally, I think where we were, and thinking about these two things, is we always talked about our opinions, and we never surprised. Like, I mean, I may have like pure resources might have seemed novel to somebody. I talked about it with Bill. I talked about it with Steve. I talked about it with everybody. We viewed ourselves, and I think we both have a great respect and affection for our friend Bill Allen, and we miss him every. I I still miss Bill is how do you apply the old time religion in Delaware with credibility? How do you make sure there are predictable pathways to get transactions done that people can rely upon and it's not litigious? And there had been a lot of doctrinal development in the 80s around the, the standards of review and they were designed for injunctions. 
and there was yeah. a lot of well, I think what Bill we would see as barnacles, right? Mm -hmm. And we had to deal with the the whole sitting there helpless while going private after going private there was a tack on tax remember on those convy lynch <laughs> settlements and there was never any litigation and if you look at the statistics the <laughs> the special committees would often hold out sh longer than the plaintiffs were. and it was frustrating so we worked all together it took a while we were as my friend norm Beasley said we were clams in the water we didn't push on this it took a while to get a case but on things like the old time religion forum shopping it was during chancellor chandler that we started pushing back against the multi-forum litigation was what frankly disabled defendants from bringing the old time motion to dismiss. It wasn't a change in the law. The law was always clear. If it's a third party deal, majority of the stockholders fully informed vote, business judgment rule. You know what happened every spring, Greg? Remember call of the calendar? So you know. Yeah. Yep. Joe <laughs> Rosenthal, as you said, was not Joe Rosenthal would stand up and he would dismiss Chancellor's thirty non-Revlon Revlon cases. What do I mean by non-Revlon Revlon cases? No resistance. He would stamp, you know why? Because everyone would call Joe and said, Joe, nothing happened during the injunction stage. Nothing good happened for you. We're going to bring the motion to dismiss. 87% uh, of the stockholders voted for it. They would dismiss it at call a calendar. Guess what? No fee paid. Nothing changed hands. Because of forum shopping and some of that stuff, it got a little un unclear. And so a lot of, I think, what we looked for was ways to with credibility, and I think our, you know, Bill, in our time, there were a lot of big, tough remedies put in place, but there was also a willingness, honestly, to to, to try to gate cases, and I think that's how we viewed kind of the doctrinal mission, mm -hmm. and even the continuity on the administrative side. You know, one of the things I did was when I came in is, it consistent with the way Bill always operated, is we put together chancery guidelines for practice. Yeah. And it really wasn't top down. Those of you who are involved or know, our rules committee worked together. And it, because we, you know, the thing about Delaware, we didn't want to be the federal courts. And I don't mean that to disparage federal courts, but you know what I mean. But anybody practice in a federal district court where every judge has their matcha tea versus the chai latte versus the whatever, and it varies by day. And this thing called the federal rules of civil procedure, right, Bill, doesn't really matter as much as the local rules. So what we wanted people to be able to do is practice in chancery as a court as a whole. And that also meant the not just the practitioners, because it's not guidelines just for practitioners, it's guidelines for the court. And we tried to do things like how would we operate consistently so you could approach the court in a predictable way. How could we frankly start the initial struggle about e-filing, the unintended consequences, because during my you know, late in our tenure, we started realizing people, law, young lawyers and paralegals are staying up till midnight to fi file nine unexpected briefs. That was never an intention of e-filing. Mm -mm. And to grapple with those things. But what I think was very much in our tradition to deal with the bar together, Greg, and as you remember, you were chair of that, and to sit down and sort of say, how do we compromise on this? And, and on technology, for example, internally we did some things, which is, it's a struggle when you have three counties sometimes unbound. So I worked on pay fairness with some of our top people because of the state system and coming out of the county system. We have some treasurers who dealt with fiduciary issues and things. They were paid less than some court clerks and things, and we, we worked on that. But we also did things like to give the judges reports on when they hadn't had action in, in 30 days, when they had action in 60 days. And we took some steps, like I, we all had wonderful colleagues, right, Bill? Every one of our colleagues was wonderful. Some were less rapidly less wonderful. Less wonderful than others. <laughs> no, I said yeah. less rapidly wonderful. Some of them did not de de you know, deliver wonder with as much rapidity or timeliness as others. And those statistics actually help. And it also helped, you know, Bill, I don't know if you remember, I, uh, we figured out a way when, you're, when you do most everything by e-filing, you actually kind of know what employees do. And we had a manager in one county. I don't want to say anything. I don't think any of us are from the county. But it was pretty clear there was one person <laughs> sitting at. I think we covered yeah. all the counties. We, we, we've just figured it out. <laughs> well, yeah, no, but I don't know which, which, which line on the border of Smyrnesia you grew up in. Uh, it's uh, Newcastle. Yes, sir. Is, uh, is, yeah. is one person sat at one desk watching another person sit at another <laughs> desk and watch a person who did all the work. And the e-filing statistics showed that. And they were really hard on that person. That person 
who did all the work had thousands of things that she did every day. I have people who had not one statistic on e-filing. And in, in what we did, Bill, right, because Bill also expanded the e-filing to all parts of the docket, which, by the way, was wonderful for small practitioners because have you ever feared losing a file? Anybody ever fear that in the old days? Well, if you're a small practitioner, right, in Chancery, there's an official record of the docket. But the point was, we could also measure, and, and objectively, our managers could then talk to an employee, and it actually became competitive. It kind of be cool because people could see they were validated because they could see what they did. And that was all building on the legacy of Bill. And I think doctrinally, don't you think, Bill, we all did try, you know, some of the most fun conversations would be Bill and me and Jack Jacobs talking about an opinion one of us wrote, and we may need to write a little bit around it. Well, let me you ask, know. ask you this sort of inside chancery. During uh, your tenures, did you circulate opinions for other judges to read? Oh, yeah. Okay. Sometimes some people who were more wonderful at that than others. <laughs> I think what Bill and I would say is we always tried, and probably Steve did and Jack, is things that were we really were struggling with or we would doctrinal significance. I think some judges did it kind of all the time. If you ever got to work with Jack Jacobs, you know, it's a wonderful thing because Jack and I are both interested in writing, but it, you don't need to go to Fourth of July if you work with Jack because you just get the pages back and there's all these things, you know what I mean? And yeah, like, they're lit up, they're lit up. Yeah. <laughs> Do not say since yeah. when you yeah. mean because, right. you know, but what I'm saying is, is I think it was a real tradition and it was mm -hmm. part of the fun of it is feeling like, you know, we would, we would try to talk about these things and try to stay in sync. And that goes back to Bill Allen's era. Yeah. I mean, even back then, because Carolyn Berger and Mo Hartman and all would look at drafts that I wrote and I would look at drafts that they wrote and I'd say, I've got to distinguish one of your cases. Is this going to work or not? Um, <laughs> that's, that's the kind of thing that I, you know, the team worked like a team. No, is, anything, let me I ask like the, air uh, gas, can I just say, yeah, just, yeah. Like, air gas is a good example. Or yeah. For me, like things like, um, you know, things like pure resources, um, IBP Tyson, I mean, those things where one of us may be the author, I, I, I owe a lot of, if, if there was any quality to what I did to, to Bill and to Jack and mm -hmm. to Myron and to John and others and those conversations that you have and, and, and figuring it, it out. That was one of the real joys of it. And as Bill said, it's also the bench bar interaction and it's the things that we do between with our constituencies. And I don't just mean the Delaware lawyers, right, Bill? I think it's the investment bankers, frankly, it's the plaintiff's lawyers, it's the institutional investors, the academics to kind of try to get it right. We may not always get it right, but to try to kind of bring to bear a certain kind of quality. And then also when you know people, you know, frankly, and you put a human face on it, I think you can have the adversarial process, but in a way that where there's a genuine community and feeling and a recognition that this is just one case in a larger system of justice. And if you don't remember that compassion and that friendship across the V, yeah then you're really going to lose the, the, the core essence of what a court of equity is. About. Well, that was always a sort of a policing element, I think, <clears throat> at least for lawyers of uh, my generation, was that the ball was, bar was small enough yeah. that I knew that the fellow or lady who was on the other side in this case would be on my side in the next case. And so I really didn't want to burn a bridge there. And also with respect to the judges, and, and we'll talk later about whether this has changed a little bit, but everyone certainly, I think, of my generation, um, you wanted, you really wanted to maintain a good reputation with yes. the judges because you were before them all the time. And I think we always felt that if, if that judge comes to believe that maybe I'm not trustworthy, that's going to really affect uh, what happens in my cases in the future. Uh, and Greg, I, yeah. I don't want to slight this man too. There's one other thing that also was in that tradition that emerged for the really first time, which was the concept of the judges of the court themselves being willing to mediate cases for other judges. And that's also a really special process because it's a way in which the bench and bar interact in a very important way but again, a little bit more informally. And, and I think during your year, Bill, that really accelerated in a big way, and I think it helped us a lot to manage growing caseloads. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let, let me go back to yeah. the, um, we, the talked, we, we heard about opinion writing yeah. and collaboration. Does that happen uh, today, and did it happen in your era, Chancellor? So I, I don't think 
to the degree that uh, Leo and Bill are describing. Um, and, but where it did happen is really in, in two respects. I think when somebody first came on a court, on the court, um, you know, I would consult with people on initial drafts of things, or another member might do so, uh, to sort of get in the groove of things. We actually had much more of a sort of open mic opportunity every week, because I instituted these weekly meetings on Monday mornings, where we sort of talked through ideas during that period of time, did lots of other things in, in that period of time. And then the other area was on big decisions, um, everybody was nice enough to give me a heads up, <laughs> so I knew what was going on, often read the draft, did have feedback. Um, and if there was something more of a sort of a policy statement kind of issue, truly is clearly comes to mind. There I expressly wanted to make sure I had to buy in the entire court, wrote, you know, circulated the draft, made sure everybody was on the same page, um, because it had more policy implications in terms of you know, how we're going to deal with a certain part of our docket. Um, but not, I think, in the way, uh, I, I didn't get a lot of red pen coming back from Jack Jacobs, let's put it that way, on a regular basis. Well, but that, that's that the way we had that input. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Chancellor McCormick? Yeah, let me uh, turn my mic on here. Um, I walked into a highly collaborative court, and, and Andy had instilled that in, in, um, in chambers, you know, where uh, Monday morning meetings were a time where we could exchange ideas genuinely. But more than that, everybody's doors open, and we all walk up and down the halls, and, uh, and you know, that idea is meaningfully. It's, it's, a, it's still that way. It's a tradition of chambers at this point, and I, and I think it's a good one. Um, and Greg, before I, before I forget, I just want to thank the Weinberg Center and Justin and the Dean uh, for hosting this wonderful event, Andy for putting it together, and just say what an honor it is to be on, on the dais here with three of my former chancellors, people I grew up litigating in front of. Um, I was a junior associate uh, litigating in front of Bill Chandler. I think I made my first legal argument in front of Leo Stryan. I was scared to death. That's, that's tough. <laughs> I got, that's tough. I, got, I got through my intro at what point, at which yeah. point he said, sounds good, sit down, issued a bench rule. <laughs> I was like, okay. Won, right? Yeah, I did win. <laughs> if it's helpful, I was the young associate arguing in front of Bill Chandler. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, I was a partner arguing in front of Andy, and really uh, he, was, he was genuinely encouraging from the bench and outside um, yeah. in these sorts of settings when, when we run into judges. So it's really, really an honor. Now, Bill Chandler never took me out for drinks after an argument. I'll have to, I'll have to <laughs> get a rain check on that one. Um, but it truly is an honor. So thank you all. Let's go back, Leo, just for a second and talk about the guidelines. Um, designed in part, I think, to help younger attorneys uh, understand uh, how we generally did things. Uh, and, and Vice Chancellor Laster was a big part of the guidelines, as I recall. Um, do the judges think that the guidelines have been helpful? Are they helpful today? Absolutely. And we did a little bit of a refresh um, recently, at least. I tried to get it done. <laughs> the chancellor had to take it over the finish line for me, but we did a little bit of a refresh on it. I think they're invaluable. And exactly for the reason Leo mentioned, it's not just for everybody in the bar, but certainly I think that's the primary audience. It's for ourselves and sort of getting how we want things to come to us uh, and having you know, as much cohesiveness in, in how people present things and the expectations of how people are going to behave and what's important and what's not important. Well, and, and, and Greg, you know, I, I don't want to dump on younger members of the bar. Let's not pretend there haven't always been you know, people who are less wonderful than others. <laughs> and one of the things, is one of the, the great underpaid people that's been a big thing of mine for time is the assistance to the yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and other courts are case managers. The reality is I tried in the Registrar of Chancery to get each judge, someone from the Registrar of Chancery to really help. But the honest point is when you talk to Chancellor McCormick's assistant, you're talking to her schedule or the person who is really running the show. We have people calling, yeah. gaming the system, telling you back, oh, Vice Chancellor Stride wanted, wants an argument between on Thursday blank between this time and that. That isn't what happened. What they did was call Peggy or Carlos or whoever. You know, one of my proudest things is my first chance for assistant. It was, became the first African American registered in Chancery, and she's now the Supreme Court Administrator. But they call Carlos and say, on behalf of all parties, we'd like this. And it comes back because it wasn't on behalf of all parties, it was one person. <laughs> And, and so those things, like, and, and just trying to instill that. And, yeah, and that's what yeah, I think, yeah. and, and, and I think Gregor, when I was I also remember, Vice Chancellor Lester was 
tremendously, you know, because he and I had, interestingly, he, Steve Lamb, and I had a sort of protocol. And we wanted, and Bill Chandler basically thought, but we had, we wanted to make sure everybody would adhere to it because it wouldn't work for the court. But we also listened to things, and, and, and BCL had a list, Greg, from practice that he brought to the bench, Andy, uh, because mm -hmm. of, of practicing and so we sat down and then tried, as you were, you were chair of the rules committee, but many of you were in the room were involved, is what are the recurring issues? And how yeah. can we just smooth things so that it's a little bit easier for everyone? You know? Yeah. Yeah, and, and one of the controversial points, or at least we discussed it a lot, was should you be able to cite these guidelines uh, in court and say, you know, my opponent violated section yeah. 2.3 of the guidelines? And we decided you should not be able to do that, that these were really designed to be um, aids to practitioners, right. not things that they could be slapped with. Uh, and I think largely people have abided by that. I remember when I was more active than I am now, there were every, every once in a while you get a letter from you somebody to the court that yeah. would say, well, this violates such and such of the guidelines. But uh, generally people abide yeah, by that, I, I think. think. That's right. uh, well, Chancellor yeah. Bouchard, uh, you mentioned weekly meetings. Sure. Talk, talk about how that happened and, and, and how useful they were to you. Really useful, and how'd they happen? Uh, well, unlike uh, my three colleagues here, uh, there's one thing different about my background, which is I went immediately in as chancellor. Um, everybody else had some time on the court. Um, Bill Allen had done that, but you know it, it's probably a better way to go in as a vice chancellor and actually learn the ropes a little bit. Uh, but I went in sort of you know knee deep in the water, and for me, I figured out you know how, how am I going to learn this organization from the inside because it's totally different dynamic. You're it's sort of either in or you're out. And, um, and I thought, very simple thing, you know, I, I'm going to just set up a meeting. I made it arbitrary, 8.30 Monday morning, let's start the week off. And um, the people who were in Newcastle County, Leo left me a beautiful chamber with a nice big uh, table. They all came uh, into my office and we put on the screens whoever was in Kent and Sussex if they weren't in Wilmington for the day. And it, it was really for me, selfishly, to sort of learn what's on people's minds, what's affecting their dockets, what's going on in the court and to educate myself. And it turned into something totally different where um, it became just sort of a natural communication vehicle. Um, so what do I mean by that? Um, well, there are a lot of things the chancellor does that uh, the vice chancellors have like no idea, no connection with. Um, Leo was left the court and with Bill in extraordinarily good condition. Um, he also was very active in having presiding judges meeting where the chief judge of each of the court meets roughly monthly, but none of the other members of my court know anything about what's going on in those meetings. So I made it a point always to do a download so that everybody sort of knew what the topics were that were branch-wide, that were significant. It could be the revamp of technology. It could be courthouse priorities. Now it's the family court uh, courthouse that's really the priority. Understanding the, you know, the legislative priorities, uh, so on and so forth. But it was my opportunity. I always had the ability. I'd start the meeting with my little agenda. And if the meeting, you know, if I had one agenda item, nobody had anything to say, we left. I was not going to keep people preoccupied. I set up at 30 minutes, but often it would go longer because people liked it. Um, and so it was my opportunity to convey information that other people may not be aware of, so they felt more beyond their little silo as a vice chancellor, more part of the court, the system, the whole judicial. Let me court. ask you this. Yeah. Might that include um, constructive criticism, obviously we're not naming names, but, but were there ever times when any of you as the chief judge yeah. uh, felt you needed to convey a message to one of the vice chancellors uh, that, you know, I've heard that this is happening and maybe that needs to be done differently? Yeah, I would do that more one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, I'm not going to out somebody, um, but m more one-on-one. -on -one. But, but the other thing that happened with these meetings like, over time, and, and I'm curious if your experience is the same or you're still doing it or not, but um, is um, they involved to people using it for discussing their dockets, the issues of the day, recurring issues that would come up. We also used it as a platform when people would approach us. We always had a natural time. You know, we had the trust bar, always had its legislative package. <laughs> I know, Leah's laughing because I didn't, I had no idea what I was walking into with that. Um, but we, you know, I could bring them in and let them talk to us or people to the attorney general's office. You know, somebody issued a capius to, a civil capius. Um, in our court to arrest somebody um, and you know they came in and said well you know we, I had somebody from the AG's office come in and talk to us about is that wise to do what should be the practices you know what if they want to extradite I mean you know it was our opportunity to have a reach out moment and have a set time to do it 
and it percolated great ideas. I see Joe Seitzman uh, in the audience. I, I'll give you one simple example. Um, you know, Joe, I think, was a year in and comes in, and I think he's holding a 50-page discovery motion. <laughs> now, Joe had been in Spirit Corps for 12 years, where your motions are four pages, um, <laughs> unless you get leave of court for something longer. And he says, I, I don't know what's going on here with discovery motions, but is this the way it's always going to be? <laughs> and, um, and it was a perfect idea. No, it shouldn't always be that way. And so we amended Rule 171 so that you know, case dispositive or merits-based motions would be the, the typical norm. But we'd pair back on, frankly, these ridiculous page limits uh, or non-limits um, for things that were you know, discovery or motions and eliminate, things of that nature. Um, and really, it was in a conversation at that meeting. And other ideas sort of gestated from that. Let, let me uh, shift gears a little bit. Yeah. Trulia. Yeah. Trulia was a decision that I think as much as any I can remember actually changed chancery practice. Yeah. Uh, talk a little bit about the, the genesis of it and uh, what you were thinking at the time. I lived through it, so I know, but, sure, but maybe sure. others didn't. Well, and Bill and Leah both lived through it because it was all part of a progression uh, of, of what sort of had evolved. So what, what was the problem, what's the solution, and maybe what, what were some of the effects of it? The problem was, you know, 90% plus, literally around 95% of M&A transactions of any economic consequence measured by $100 million or more were sued on. And of course, a lot of this activity is coming to Delaware. By the time I got to the court, the forum stuff was sort of resolving. So it was really focused in, in the Court of Chancery. And we had, uh, you know, what had developed was sue on every deal. A plaintiff comes in, always has the power of an injunction to hold up a deal. Um, the defendants, therefore, are very incentivized to accommodate some discovery, make them happy, maybe fix up the disclosures, get a nice release, clean up everything, and be done with it. It's a non-adversarial process. Um, the disclosures uh, typically had no value, and we were uh, being in, in put in the position of approving settlements with very broad releases. Um, in exchange for really no consideration in the form of, of these disclosures that really had no content or meaning to them. And a merger tax was being applied essentially to every deal um, you know, in the country that was uh, coming to Delaware. Um, I know Bill saw some of it. it. I think it got worse under, Le not worse than numbers, under Leo's tenure where people were actually rejecting uh, certain settlements. I think Leo's last, if that I was my last correctly, thing was your last act, right, was to reject the disclosure settlement. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I'd been about a year and a half in, and it was continuing on enormous volume. And it was, you know, we talked about it. This is one of the things we talked about at the weekly meeting, and we said, you know, th this has got to change. If, if for nothing else, good hygiene, it's got to change. As I recall, you started and other judges started the process by giving speeches when you were approving settlements yeah, and yeah, saying, yeah. I have to tell you, yeah. I'm getting sick of this. We're not going to do a lot more of them, and you need to start coming with some real consideration. Uh, then it evolved into yeah. Trulia. So that's the problem. The solution was Trulia basically sending the message that we were going to give greater scrutiny uh, to these settlements. Um, and the point of that was uh, the phrase, that the sort of the magic phrase in the opinion was, if you're going to, you can do a disclosure settlement. There can be disclosure settlements that are legitimate, but it's got to be real, and it should be obvious that it's real and not junk. And so the phrase was plainly material. Something should be plainly material in the sense that it's obvious there's real value. You've really uh, you know, identified a material omission that you've filled with the disclosure, or you've corrected a truly material uh, misstatement or something that's misleading. And in that, in that circumstance, you know, there's the bargain. There's the consideration to justify a settlement. But if not, we're going to be looking for this. And virtually the minute it came down, um, the cases, and predictably, I saw it would happen, you know, went to federal court, um, and the environment in Delaware had changed. Now, some may, people may say, isn't that a horrible thing to go to federal court? But I, I think if you look back now, we've got about five or six years of data, you do, do see that the aggregate numbers are down um, of these filings. Um, and the reason I go to federal court is you just take a state law disclosure, duty of disclosure claim, just dress it up as a Section 14A claim, and you can go to federal court. Um, but the number, aggregate numbers are down. Um, the other thing you see is that all the cases now uh, typically do not settle where there's a release involved. They are typically mooted, uh, which I'm okay with. And I telegraphed into where I'd be okay with that. 
um, because at least in that context, um, you know, there can be a business judgment made by the company to, to pay a fee if there was actually a benefit conferred. And if it's junk and they want to oppose it, they can oppose it. Um, so it's largely mootness kind of settlements that are occurring. It's interesting, it's really like two firms that control like 70 or 80% of the market. So it does still, still go on. But I think it's better process for Delaware not to be participating. Well, what, in that. Trey, what you're saying, Chancellor, I think is, and is right, is that we lost nothing doctrinally no. because these cases did not make law. The federal courts need to listen to your decision yeah. and the trend of things. And I've, there's a good Seventh Circuit thing that does, but yeah, some of the federal yeah. courts, and if those of you who are involved with the Cornerstone study, you need to add a Cornerstone study of the federal courts. But because there still remains the basic ethical issue of yeah. why someone brings a suit challenging a deal when they actually yeah. desperately want the deal to go through. I yeah. don't think we've exactly cured that yeah. at all. Yeah. But this was much more credible for Delaware, yeah. and it leaves space, right, Andy, yeah. for the real cases of the court. I mean, it's still a, a, a problem because these people didn't want an injunction to reveal something that would bring down the deal. They mostly would like tell the world five more things why the deal is great and give us a fee. And so, but it's so much better and I think your leadership on that and the courts is very much appreciated by our national constituency. I mean, there have been a number of things over the years that I recall people saying, oh, this is really going to hurt Delaware. This is going to uh, push business elsewhere. Chancery practice is going to decline. It's never happened. We may have fewer filings, but the court is busier than ever because the cases have uh, more uh, merit to them, more gravitas. Well, let me harken back yes. to something you asked earlier, which is the, the more trials. Yeah. Because I think the, the more trials phenomena was in full bloom <laughs> during, during my era. Yes. But there are really like two factors behind that. One is there was um, a shift in the case mix of the court. Um, if you look back 30 years and you back out guardianship, trust estate cases, it was probably 90% corporate governance and about 10% commercial. If you do the same backing out sort of at the beginning of my era, it's almost a parity, 50-50 uh, kind, of, kind of mix. And that it, phenomena means uh, you basically have economic actors making bets on both sides of a case as opposed to personal liability being at stake in, in a governance case. And so it's, it's just about money. It's just about, okay, is it worth litigating? Um, and often people are making the bets it is. Then you have more discovery, more motion practice, more summary judgment, more trials. And that's a, that's a big pressure point that developed. And on the corporate governance side, um, we moved past the, the stage of just injunctions. And plaintiffs, and my firm included, we actually didn't want an injunction. We wanted the deal to close and have a damages case. Um, and it's, it's a mercantile decision to, to some extent because it's a real payoff potentially. And, um, and that phenomena also was recurring. And you know, doctrinally, that was a big issue my court faces, and Leah really sort of mastered all the law in this area, was how you deal with all those post-closing damage kind of cases. But more of those were going to trial. That was really the fulcrum that pushed it. And the bar had to change because unlike the Superior Court uh, where uh, Vice Chancellor Slice uh, spent so much time a lot of the chancery practitioners didn't really know how to try cases. And, and <laughs> they so, learned quickly. <laughs> you know, we, we, we all had to learn uh, yeah. all about uh, uh, how this works. and what have you, Has anyone learned the, that the state of mind exception is not <laughs> for the state of mind of anyone in the world, but is actually for the declarant bill? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, we did have to pull out those, uh, those hearsay rules. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Your Honor, just give it the weight it deserves. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Chancellor McCormick, let's turn to you. Uh, you started right in the middle of uh, the Zoom era. Right. How, well, how did that work for the court? Well, just the timeline is actually I started in November of 2018, and I would peg the Zoom era onset uh, to the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah, I meant as Chancellor. Oh, yeah, as yeah. Chancellor. I was in the middle. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just to step back and, and give you a sense of the timeline of the court. Um, so I, I came on the scene November 2018, less than a year and a half later, the pandemic hit, and I just want to give a lot of credit to Chancellor Bouchard and the Chief Justice uh, Sites for, um, for stepping up and being great leaders at a time, uh, making tough decisions that not everybody agreed with that saved lives in the court <laughs> among our litigants and the staff. So that was really important. Can you turn the volume up a little bit? Your volume up. Thank you. Yeah, I, I don't know how to do that, so I'll just talk louder. <laughs> 
So, um, yeah, so, you know, I, I felt like I was just getting my sea legs when the pandemic hit and the court changed gears um, as a judge. And uh, we, I guess the first state of emergency order came out the end of March 2020. Yeah. And our court went wholly virtual for the first three months of that period. You know, we all retreated to the corners of our in-home offices, kind of scratching our heads, wondering how we're going to do things. And fortunately, this amazing technology, Zoom, made it possible to access litigants. And, you know, I didn't have the typewriter that Bill Chandler mentioned, but I felt like I was operating at that level. <laughs> I mean, our court was really stripped to its, to its essence, which was, um, dedicated civil ser servants who were just unwilling to fail. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, we all learned Zoom the hard way. We learned about Zoom bombing the hard way. Um, we developed protocols very quickly. And uh, after the first three months, we felt like we were in a groove. Um, this all happened at a time where, as the Chancellor mentioned, you know, cases were increasing in volume, mm -hmm. cases were increasing in complexity, and suddenly we also had an influx of COVID-related cases yeah. that were high intensity. It required us pushing everything to the side to handle, like busted deals and poison pills and, and voting-related cases as well. Um, so, you know, our, our court changed gears, um, and, you know, after three months, we went back in person to a degree with occupancy restrictions and masking restrictions. It's only just this month that we are back to kind of where I started as a judge, physically oh. in a courthouse, you know, hearing cases in the middle of a eight-day trial that some of you were involved in. I, you know, I, I made the declaration that we can unmask. You yeah. know, <laughs> I can see your faces, and and it was it was a wonderful thing. But um, but I do think we've emerged as a court. Um, having learned a lot, uh, we're able to reassess our priorities, um, re refocus ourselves on the goals, um, recommit to, to the people around us. The pandemic was really a testament to the fact that the strength of the court is now and has always been our people. Um, and that kind of refocuses us on what we need to invest in. One, one thing that seems to me to have worked like a charm, and this may have come in in your uh, era, Chancellor Bouchard, was this um, expectation standard that arguments are only going to go for a set period of time. Oh, well, that, that was really a practical change. Yeah. Uh, when actually the time you came on the bench, we went from five to seven. Um, we had, we didn't have a courtroom for every judge. And so, uh, you know, the, the the history had been, you know, you can, it was like open mic You go forever. You get the morning, you get the afternoon, <laughs> yeah. you just fill the space, take as much time as you want, which is sort of crazy when you think about yes. it. I mean, it, so when we had sort of uh, the courtroom space constraint, um, we'd sort of been taking trials in one and a half hour blocks during the day anyway. We just applied that calendar and said, we'll have four blocks in a day per court. And the expectation will be you have an hour and a half, but you know, if you need more, you can apply for more. And we just sort of set it up that way. And uh, nobody is complaining, as far as I can no. tell you. Everybody you, you can say what you need to say. <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah. No. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> wants more time. All right. Do, do you have litigants complaining they don't have enough time, Chancellor? Absolutely. Yes. They, you know, we, it becomes in the form of motions for leave to extend time or, or have two blocks of time. And we're accommodating. I mean, these are really complicated yeah. cases. Yeah. We do want to hear what people have to say. Chancellor, can I ask a question about that? Because it was interesting. People, when I went to the Supreme Court, asked me, like, do you wish the arguments are longer? And I'm like, in some cases, but in most, I wish, you know, in a lot of them, I'd like them to be over at 11 minutes. And no, and I was wondering whether the 90 minutes has created any expectation that in, because the other, I think, Bill, I always liked about Chancery is, to be honest, you could have a 20 minute argument yeah. where it was valuable to hear from the lawyers, it was one thing, but it would be done in 20 minutes. As have people been, are people still amenable to the U.S. Chancellor saying, I'm sizing this, and yeah, we have a 90-minute courtroom, but you've got, you know, this argument is over. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think yes is the short answer, particularly the, the players in this room right. um, recognize yeah. that not every issue is, is made the same or requires as much air time. So. Yeah, and you can seek leave, and people are, are, you know, they come forward and seek leave when they need it. I mean, it is immensely valuable, and I remember some hearings that went a long time with you, Leo, but you know, you work through a complicated contract, and you got to work through it. Right. And sometimes you really have to have that time, and, and that's No, that's and that was my, that, to yeah. be honest, that was my frustration yeah. a little bit on the Supreme Court, uh, uh, Chancellor McCormick, was that 
the magic of chancery in many ways is you as the judge in a, in a, in, with the one party in a real chain right. of argument and in those contract cases going through it and the lawyer on the other side. But I also found that same magic worked in shrinking arguments right. to their essence when you did. Right. And, and but, but what I don't mind losing is the notebook opens and the lawyer says, well, before I get to my prepared remarks, <laughs> I'd like to you know, just introduce people and something like, prepared remarks, wait a minute here, this is going to be an argument. We're going to have some give and take. I'm not really going to listen to that 40 pages you got there. <laughs> well, that all changed in my mind with uh, Chancellor Allen. Uh, he was very, yeah, very active yeah, on yeah, the bench, yeah. And, yeah. and he started a tradition which uh, continues. Uh, I also remember somewhat fondly uh, arguing in front of Vice Chancellor Hartnett, never said anything. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, he would make some notes every once in a while, but it, it wasn't, uh, there wasn't a lot of interaction. Chancellor McCormick, you've seen a steady diet of 220 cases, uh, derivative actions. Uh, speak a little bit to those types of matters. Right. Uh, so, um, actually, you know what? I'm going to do what every good Delaware lawyer does and ignore your question <laughs> and, <laughs> and circle back to something um, that Chancellor uh, Chandler mentioned earlier, because uh, I, I don't want to lose sight of this yes. or, or, or not allow it to, to fit in. Um, the quality of the culture of people who are invested in the Court of Chancery, and particularly the bar, is top notch. It always has been. And there's a, a level of respect between litigants and judges that is, un, you know, you can't recreate that in other jurisdictions. And it's always seemed to me that it's been uniquely resilient to market forces that plague other communities of lawyers. That we've always had each other's backs, that we've always gone out for drinks after arguments and maintained this level of civility. And I heard today from you, um, you know, Chief Justice, and from others that as the bar grows, and uh, we're at risk of losing this culture. At least it's becoming diluted. And certainly, we have concerns about that from the bench as well. And if there's one thing the pandemic did, it's <laughs> heightened those concerns by sending each other away from the communities where these virtues are taught into you know, nooks and crannies of their homes. And you know, I, I really want to take this moment to say to the people in this room who are the people who, who keep us together as a community and, and really reinforce those, those virtues and those cultures, that as we reunite post-pandemic, we as a court have viewed it as an opportunity to reaffirm our values and focus on our core values. And, and I would invite everyone to do the same. As you, as you get back into your law firms, um, actively mentor and virtue signal to your young associates and know that we're here to do it with you through CLEs like this, um, through you know, creative programs that we've talked about with persons like Bill Lafferty through the Rules Committee and other moments like that. I wanted to just kind of follow up on what the, what the Chancellor said and make sure that was clear. Now to your question. Well, that, that's okay. This is much more interesting um, if, if we can uh, continue on this. Um, do you see, without, obviously you wouldn't name any names, but do you see patterns in the conduct of the bar that give you some concern, Chancellor, and are there particular things that we all need to do better? Yeah, I, and I think that's true of everyone who's you know, in this polarized world, in this post-pandemic world, um, in, in, our, in our individual market, a growing community. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot we can do better, um, and we know what they are. And certainly, the intensity of cases, um, you know, more cases going to trial, has created more zealous advocates, not always in the best ways. And it's, it's resulted in some inefficiencies for the court. Um, and so that's something we can improve on. Uh, and certainly, the court can, can, we can do our best to aid in that, um, aid in that process by making our expectations clearer, um, particularly for non-Delaware attorneys, so that Delaware attorneys can kind of promulgate the message elsewhere. So. That, that certainly was a focus uh, a number of years ago. I can't remember exactly in what setting, but maybe in the guidelines, the message came out, um, listen, there is no such thing as local counsel. Right. You know, oh, yeah. you need to be actively yes. involved with your uh, out-of-town counsel, and uh, uh, I take a chance that you're reiterating uh, that message. Let me ask uh, all of the judges, were there times when you pulled someone aside privately, maybe with his or her opponent in chambers, and said, you need to do something differently here, this isn't working? I, I did that probably five or six times in yeah. my career, and uh, I learned it from Judge Latcham. 
I didn't do it in the courtroom. No, right. I didn't do it on the record. I just simply invite counsel to come back to my chambers. Now, I think every time I did that, they knew that I was upset about something because right. I would point the finger like that and say, <laughs> can I see you in chambers? And the Very subtle. But the beautiful thing about that that I learned from Judge Latcham, I mean, he taught me this, is that by the time I got back to chambers, I'd calm down a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And by the time they got to chambers, they were on bended knee. Oh, yeah. Apologetic <laughs> to no end. And, and to me, that's the way it ought to be done. It, it doesn't need to be done in the opinion. It doesn't need to right. be done on the record. Because you know what? Judges make mistakes. They make mistakes. They sometimes jump to conclusions. They draw inferences when they shouldn't draw them. And if you call it out in the opinion or on the record, you are damaging potentially a reputation forever. It yeah. never goes away. So you've got to resist that. You've got to resist that temptation to say, you've done something wrong and I'm calling you out right now and here's what you're gonna do. If you do that, you, you're, <laughs> you're taking real risks in my opinion. Yeah, and can I jump in on that? I, I, I think there is praise in public, reprimand in private goes a long way. And I think one of the things, you know, I've said sorry to litigants on the record when I was in pain. I mean, a lot of my days with trial were trial, you know, and things I learned from like our court reporters about the importance to them and therefore to litigants of a predictable schedule. Don't have your, um, you know, law and order moment at 1043 and want to go to 11 because if you want expedited transcript, those reporters alternate out, and they're human beings too. But often at 12.30 to 1, I'd have an evidentiary thing on a frickin' phone. And one improvement on Zoom, <laughs> they should allow the judge to be able to mute people. No, because everybody in this room knows it's like people talking over each other. And I would often interest say, like, it's a busy week. It's now Thursday. Because I, I do an evidentiary thing at 12.30 to 1 and 1 to 1.30, and then I go on the bench. I've said sorry and things, but I, I am proud of that. I don't think that I ever left a lawyer with a legacy. Right. And honestly, I think we also try to remember that what we don't see. Business lawyers every day counsel people to avoid gray areas. They can, you don't see those things. And it's also just as a judge, if you, if you get out early in a case with an attitude, it's hard to walk back. And I think, to be honest, during the Zoom era, we've all gotten a little remote from each other. And there's callousness on both sides. And that doesn't help us all. And what I mean is if the court itself is also not sensitive to that, and, 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 and realize, you know, people are under pressure. It doesn't mean that you don't talk to, I talked to, I remember your firm sent a very talented associate, senior associate, to handle an argument, Greg, <laughs> against <laughs> Chancellor <laughs> Bouchard. <laughs> And he was, he was put in a position that was terrible and indefensible. He argued an indefensible <laughs> position, but he kind of knew it and he was honest. I treated him very, with kid gloves. He's now a member of the judiciary. I called up Frank Bellotti and I think I called up you. And I said, why was this talented young member of the bar I'm happy to say I don't remember you calling me, but you, it might have happened. It might have happened. No, but remember I did the talk selective to... selective memory problem? Yeah, right, yes, yeah, no, I, I do. I None of us have And I said, memories. I want that uh, young lawyer. And I think I'd be proud of that transcript, so I think Andy would remember that. Yes, I remember that. And I think I was quite gentle with him, because yeah. I understood that he was coming before me to argue something from somebody in New York who might have been at a firm we have some honored guests from. And, but I mean, it was a moment that kind of like Bill said, and, and I think we've lost a little bit of, of that. And I think you have to realize that this internet world is different. And what you say on a transcript, what you say in opinion, it tags someone for their whole life. And honestly, we, we, I was raised as in a religion where there's only one thing that knows everything. And I think that's where one of the things that, that Bill Allen always taught me is that most in the business world is, is gray, right, Bill? Mm -hmm. And that even for the business people involved, but I think there's so much that our profession and our national bar does to actually in, in create credibility in corporate governance that we need to remember. 
And if you compare cases where people are being criticized, and if you look at the level of practice in those cases, and you compare them to how things would have been done in 1978, 1988, or 1998, we've got to be mindful that we are at the edge of micromanagement. And for example, it's telling when it's never been easier to buy a company because there are no classified boards, when there's plenty of capital. It should be telling in a case that no one with real money is arguing they were impeded. And it's just to say that all I'm saying, I think Bill is saying a little bit the same thing, is what makes the magic work is not just the bar living up to traditions. It's the bench and the bar together and opening ourselves to say, you know, I had to learn five years in that I actually didn't have good looking bangs. And part of how I learned that was transactional lawyers. <laughs> no, what I mean is they don't care, right? They're litigants, right, Bill? And I learned, they made it very clear to me that if I thought my bangs were looking good, I didn't even have bangs. And that's what I'm saying is that that magic, and I, I know, Chancellor, you're that way, is the, the Zoom era has been a little bit hard for that interaction in a human way to have that drink and I think we're all hoping we can get yeah, that back. I think we're all eager to get back into communities where, where there can be constructive chatter um, from both sides. That's certainly the case. I will say um, I totally agree, and I hope I live up to uh, my goal, which is to never you know, intend to embarrass someone in court and be a gracious judge who is constructive and feedback. I'm imperfect. I'm, I'm sure that we would all, we would all own up to that. Um, and all of my colleagues stand in the same position. Uh, sometimes things simply need to be said. And I think one of the things I admired most about you litigating in front of you, um, Chief Justice, was that you said it. For example, I remember sitting in your courtroom and you holding up a page that was fully redacted <laughs> <laughs> and saying, how is this public access? Who did this? <laughs> you know, and that needed to be said. And it was a moment that we could repeat, we could show the transcript to our forwarding attorneys and say, look, you know, this isn't how it's done. You know, this is how this is what the judge expects. And it was it was appropriate, it was firm, it wasn't embarrassing, it needed to be said. And there are things that we need to say on the record so that they are virtues that are repeated and wielded. And and it's a fine balance to do that without, you know, harming a reputation or embarrassing someone and making sure that the cultures we adhere to Move forward. And, and sometimes, uh, I think quite effectively, the members of the court, uh, including you know, very recently, have had messages that they wanted to get out to the bar and said in the course of argument, now look, you know, this is a problem. And I want you all to go back to your firms and tell everybody exactly. that I view this to be a problem. And that is one way of, of, of helping us uh, improve the way we act. But Chancellor McCormick, I'm really happy to hear that it sounds like you and your court, you know, want to start this uh, this dialogue yeah. uh, with the bar and look restart for opportunities. It, I would say. Yeah. But, yeah, and restart and, and look for opportunities for us all to get together and uh, and I think that needs to happen in the bar. Forget about the bench for mm -hmm. a second. In my uh, experience, I think the the adversarialness between members of the Chancery Bar is greater now than it ever was before, and partly it's because they're better uh, plaintiff's lawyers maybe than there used to be, no offense to anyone. But I do think that that's something we as a bar can do better on. I remember uh, Frank Bellotti, uh, I showed him a letter, I was an associate, I was gonna write to Joe Rosenthal and he was just, just threw it away. He said, don't send that letter, yeah, that's gonna hurt your relationship with Joe for years. Pick up the mm -hmm. phone and call him, he's a reasonable guy. And I think we do need to get back to uh, that on the bar side where you have experienced lawyers like Joel and, and Blake and, and others who, you know, can, when there's a problem, Bill Lafferty, pick up the phone and, uh, and maybe just figure it out without a bunch of letters that well, accuse I, everybody of I, violating, you know, the rules Greg, of professional Greg, I'd be interested in, in Chancellor McCormick and Chancellor Bouchard because they've been in this seat more recently. Than, you, know, I, you know, one of the, the real problems, I think, though, in terms of this is Commercial cases can be mutually assured de destruction. Yeah. And one of the things I always thought was the goose and gander rule mm -hmm. works really well in those things because I always found, Bill, that honestly, if you apply the privilege stuff, I mean, if you emphasize the role of the local lawyers, I never ordered a, a privilege log unsealed. I shrank privilege logs, and how I did it is said, Mr. Margulies, I see you're leading your team, Mr. Lafferty, you're leading your team. You will go over these privilege logs, here's the goose and gander rules, and they would shrink. Yeah. 
There's more asymmetric discovery cases, Absolutely. and the electronic discovery is out of control. And by the way, it's really hard for the court because people say, well, in small business cases, don't have electronic discovery. Well, guess what? The smaller the business, the more likely they have no paper files at all. <laughs> and how is the asymmetric thing? You know, how do you two think about this in terms of the bench bar relationship? Because there, it is different when somebody's on one side and all they want is and I mean this word, look it up. It, do not praise a judge by calling the pros fulsome. I mean fulsome <laughs> discovery. Yeah. And then they have nothing to produce on their side. Because I think that is also part of what has come in. Because even in a takeover case, Greg, if you want like a, a hostile bidder coming in on someone, right, Bill? There'd be plenty of discovery mm -hmm. from sure. the hostile bidder. Yeah. But in these cases, it's really all on the defendants. That also creates hydraulic settlement pressure. You know, so any claim, that gets by a motion to dismiss creates settlement value. And I was wondering mm -hmm. whether how you two look at the bench and bar dynamic and talking through those issues, because it really is a yeah. new era mm -hmm. um, for that. Well, do you want to speak first or? Nope. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, look, asymmetric discovery in stockholder representative litigation is just like a fact of life. You sort of have to work it. Um, I think. The real balance is sort of on the defense side and having proportionality to where you are in a case. Um, but you, you know, the, you're not gonna get around the fact that it's just a sure. totally imbalanced environment. I think the broader issue is, um, and Leo, you I think said it really perfectly, in, in terms of temperament and tone. Um, I probably tolerated a lot more stuff that was edgy in discovery, bending over backwards, you know, not to come down hard on people sort of publicly. And I think you're exactly right. It's sort of you know public praise, and you know privately you can send a message, and sort of did the same thing Bill did, but it was pretty, pretty infrequent. Only 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 a few times. One thing I worry about is this, and this gets back to the the very beginning of the conversation about how the the bench and bar changed. The repeat player phenomenon is a great thing for our bar because you know your credibility is everything, and you're never going to let it get tarnished. I, and I always thought. Day one, I have no role in this business if you can't maintain your credibility. Um, and the, the concern I have is the bar has become much more fractured. And so some of, of the, you know, the elders, if you will, um, that were sort of responsible informally for instilling that culture of, you know what, the court's time is a precious commodity. You, you treasure that time. And you don't, it's not open mic night. You don't abuse that privilege of using the court. And that, that was communicated down by Rod Ward in our case at, at Skadden. I'm sure it was by Frank and other people. Um, you know, Ed McNally could be a crusty old guy, but he, if he came to court, he, he had a reason. He wasn't just there to have fun. And he can have be very and he can be crusty. And he can be very fun. No, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, no he can be very fun. Yeah. But, um, and I, I worry that, um, you know, I'm, I love to see lots of firms come to Delaware but a lot of the regional firms, they only have a few lawyers. Uh, they, don't, um, they don't have sort of a senior elder. Um, they don't come frequently enough where putting your reputation on the line matters um, and that it's important, uh, therefore, to sort of conform to, to behave in a way you'd expect. And, and that's where I worry about it. And that's why I think that the kind of things you're trying to do, Katie, are absolutely you know, what needs there, to There is some precedent for dealing with that problem. Uh, this happened a few years ago, maybe more than a few now. But uh, the Chief Justice uh, had the idea of reaching out and really educating the bar. And we really were trying to focus a lot on these non-traditional Delaware firms that didn't quite have the history here on what it means to be a Delaware lawyer. And so I don't know how many sessions we had, but maybe seven or eight uh, with managing partners of firms. And some of them, managing partners of these non-traditional firms were people that um, I'd never heard of, you know. Uh, and, and, and yet they were litigators and they, they appeared in the Court of Chancery. And so we had a four-part uh, presentation, which as I recall, involved um, pro bono service, service to the court, support of uh, CCJ and uh, involvement in the Bar Association, which a lot of these firms really weren't at all interested in uh, before I think we had this seminar. So I think maybe that's a model that we could use mm -hmm. Chancellor McCormick going forward in terms of you know just, just speaking to people about, look, here are the things that we do and don't do as Delaware lawyers, because I think that education probably is yeah. necessary. I think it's my own experience a little bit is I, 
I also think today's quote young lawyers, by young I mean you know 40 or something like that, <laughs> are not as uh, uh, deferential to the older partners as as uh, as we were. Like poor, Charlie Richards, when Char no no no, when Charlie Richards told you to do something, you did it. There was no questioning. And now there's just much more of a questioning process. Uh, the executive committee in our firm used to be when they made a decision, it was done. Now they make a decision, it's the beginning of a discussion, which is, is, is good and bad. But I, but I do think we, we need to increase this education process. You're not going to tell people what to do now like people used to, but you can teach them how to act. But you need tone at the time. One of the things you, we all, there were expectations. These four things we sort of, Greg, worked together with other people on was we were trying to, there was an expectation, to be honest, that you served on an arm of court. Yeah. It's really important to the court of chancery, for example. I, I would say the transactional lawyer. You can go to bank, you, bankruptcy uh, lawyers, those of you who do corporate counseling. You can be a guard, you can do guardianship stuff that's very helpful to the court. You can learn that. And there was a tradition that you did. And there was a tradition often when somebody was the president of the bar, they had somebody who worked with them. But it was also getting you on the arms of court. And the problem is, you know, there were partners at firms who, they never did any of this. And I do think the new generation also, they want to have, if we want to improve the diversity of our bar on all levels and include people, they want to have an identity. They want to feel that you're giving back. And I think some of the stuff, Greg, is really helps them and our community and the court. But it's hard to know a tradition if you've not been taught it and if the senior people at the firm to value it. Because I think some people were surprised that we sort of point blanked them and said, you have 20 lawyers in Delaware and you haven't given the combined campaign for justice for the last five years. And they're like, why, well, why is that an expectation? Well, because we're supposed to be a justice system and to serve everybody. And people forget, we haven't talked about this, but one of the dearest things to me in Chancery is the guardianship side of the document, yeah. is the wills. And honestly, I kept a, I did, routine petitions, mm -hmm. I did a calendar, I would never give that up because I felt like it was impor important. And I think members of the corporate bar have historically, I look at Bill Lafferty, Bill Lafferty has done all kinds of family court work over the years. And I think he would tell you that's among the most meaningful things he's ever done. And, he's, and people have helped with guardianships. In a, in a world where it's often callous and difficult to be a business lawyer, where young lawyers don't see meaning to have that support and to feel a part. And many of us got to know judges early in our career, not because we were arguing a preliminary injunction case. We might have been sitting in court. It's because we served on an arm of court because we did something else. And so I'm just saying, I think that's a great okay. point. We, we have uh, exhausted our time. Can uh, I give one thing? Yes. Uh, any member of the Court of Chancery Bar <laughs> should read if you want to absorb all the lessons, Wood Sorrel House by Zach Williams, which is in the New Yorker, March 21st, 2022. Uh, it's a central reading, and you'll get it. Uh, Chief Justice Seitz assures us you get one hour of ethics credit if you read this. So it's Wood Sorrel House by Zach Williams. If, if my son knew that just happened, he would never speak to me again. But that's okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank, thank you. you so much. This was great. A lot of takeaways and pearls of wisdom, and I want to thank you, Chancellor Bouchard, for putting this together, and thank all of the chancellors and the Chief Justice uh, for, uh, for participating. Greg, you were a wonderful moderator, and we really appreciate it. Let's just take a quick break and then come on back for two substantive panels on Delaware law. Thanks. Thank you.